Hey, everybody. Welcome to the second episode. Uh, welcome to all of you. I'm hoping that Holly and Amaryllis and Charles Eisenstein are on the phone. We're going to talk today about how to make America more affordable. And these are issues that I talk about almost every day, about the uh, disintegration, the deterioration of America's middle class, about the difficult choices that Americans are making every single day. Uh, elderly Americans who are splitting their, their prescription pills in two to make them so that they can afford food. Uh, mothers who are downgrading the ingredients of their groceries to make it through the checkout line. Uh, uh, this kid who came up to me and in New Hampshire about a month ago, who told me that every Tuesday he has to choose between putting gas in his car and getting a meal that day. And parents who sit in, a, uh, in an apartment they can no longer afford and with a baby crying on their lap and having to wonder whether that baby is $50 sick or $100 sick or $1,500 sick before they bring him to a hospital. And these are the kind of difficult choices that were almost unimaginable for the American middle class when I was growing up. I lived through a period that economists know of as the, the Great Prosperity. It was a 50-year period following World War II when the American middle class became the greatest economic generator in the history of mankind. When my uncle was president, I was a 10-year-old boy. Our country owned half the wealth on the face of the earth. We were the biggest exporter of goods. Uh, but we were also a moral authority around the world. And, uh, and everybody looked to us for economic leadership as well as world leadership and moral leadership. And all of that now is disintegrating. And when I go to rural areas in Pennsylvania and Ohio and uh, in Arizona or New Hampshire where I was this morning or Maine where I was yesterday, I'm finding Americans who can no longer afford to live in this country. And the most unaffordable thing are homes. We've gone from average housing price two years ago at $215,000 a home to $400,000 today. And the Interest rates on in those homes have gone from 3% two years ago to 7% today. So the, the actual price of that home is four or five times what was or was a couple of years ago. And, you know, the reason that the, the middle class grew in this country was because of home ownership. We made sure after World War II with the GI Bill and other instrumentalities to get an entire generation of, of Americans into their home. And if you own a home, you care about your community. You care about your hospital, your health care system. You care about your police protection. You care about your transportation. You care about the appearance of your home. You care about your neighbors. You're invested in that community. But more important, you have an entree to the capitalist system because you have equity. You can take a second mortgage, and if you have an entrepreneurial impulse, you can bet your home on it. You can build a restaurant. You can start a small business, a retail outlet, a, 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 a garage. And that's what happened after World War II. You had millions of Americans who suddenly had access to capital, and they pursued their their entrepreneurial dreams, what, what Franklin Roosevelt called America's industrial genius. And they built our country. And now we're going away from home ownership. We're going toward a, a system of, instead of an ownership society, we're going into a rental society. And in doing that, we go from being citizens to being subjects. And those are some of the things that we want to talk about today and the, the solutions that we're going to implement when I get into the White House. And I want to welcome Amaryllis and Charles. And uh, maybe, Charles, could you talk for a little bit? 
Uh, yeah, sure. <clears throat> yeah, thanks um, for inviting me here. Um, you know, you mentioned <clears throat> the the uh, simultaneous decline of American economic power with the decline of our moral authority in the world. And th those two trends are closely connected because the um, imperialism and the forever wars and the coups and the, the support for dictators all over the world uh, was an extremely expensive endeavor. The things that destroyed our moral standing also destroyed our economy. The, the, our balance of payments in trade uh, began to go negative uh, just right around the time of the Vietnam War when we started to uh, spend more and more uh, you know, on, on war making and began to neglect <clears throat> our industrial base, our infrastructure, and, and you know, the domestic economy, and then began offshoring our jobs to other countries and financializing our own economy. So these, the, the, and now, so now it's 40, 50 years later and we see the results. So it's not something that happened overnight and it's not something that uh, a few uh, subsidized programs are going to reverse overnight, but we can do two things. First, we can mitigate some of the most immediate effects that are making life miserable for tens of millions of Americans. And then we can also begin to reverse some of these longstanding trends. And, and you know, in the campaign, some of the ones we've been talking about the most are to unwind military empire um, and to uh, undo the corporate capture of our government that has, and the Wall Street capture that has, and the deregulation of the financial markets that has allowed them to strip mine the real economy. And so what you were talking about with the housing, that's just one example of that. You know, any, any source of equity and wealth held by the vast majority of the public, uh, by individuals, by pensions, all that stuff is ripe for financialization. So that's a, that's, that's a couple of uh, big picture things. And, and I would like to, um, you know, zoom in then uh, from that big picture we have our uh, director of engagement here, Holly Baird, uh, who's been, um, you know, having a lot of conversations with just regular Americans, you know, and maybe Holly, if you'd like to share some of the, um, some of what you're seeing, what you're hearing, because, uh, you know, the statistics say the economy, or at least the statistics that the Biden administration is putting out, say the economy is great, unemployment's low. Uh, you know, the economy's growing, things are great, right? But why is it that that doesn't correspond to so many people's lived experience? So, so Holly, maybe you have a, a couple things to say about that. Yeah, thank you, Charles. Uh, you know, to Mr. Kennedy's point, creating equity in your community, but not feeling that your country has your back, that's the overall theme that we're seeing when we're on the campaign trails from diverse backgrounds and communities. These are working class families in metropolitan cities and rural populations. And it's the same anecdote highlighting, you know, the different facets of the economic crisis in our country. Lack of access to medical preventive medical care, lack of access to quality childcare, affordable, stable housing. And they're worried about just putting food on the plates of their families. You know, you have local businesses shutting down. Um, one woman that we met in downtown Los Angeles during our 9-11 event, uh, breast cancer survivor, um, healthcare costs are unbearable, and you know her employer is no longer offering insurance, and she's literally worried about if she can go to her next checkup for breast cancer and if it's coming back. And just the economic struggles that these people are facing, it, it's they don't have any hope. And and I, I think with the policies that you guys are developing, and when you are in the White House, I, I think you are restoring hope. Charles, sorry, I was unmuted, but Charles, why don't you talk a little bit 
about the, you know, what you call the financialization of the economy. And, you know, I, I love the connection that you made between the deindustrialization of the American economy and the war machine. And it was in 1971 that, you know, at the height of the Vietnam War, when we, we realized we, um, at that point, we were paying for the war by, uh, by cannibalizing the war on poverty, which is why Martin Luther King became a peace activist in 1968, one of the reasons. But also, we just couldn't afford it. And uh, President Nixon responded to that by decoupling the American dollar from the gold standard. And that began this, uh, this cycle that we have of printing money in a way that was pretty much unprecedented in, in at least the history of our country. Um, and, you know, uh, Amaryllis, Amaryllis likes to talk about the fact that over the past 10 years, we printed more money than during the terms of every president of the United States since George Washington. And ultimately, that the decisions about when and how that money is printed is no longer the purview of, of the American president, but it's the purview of, of Wall Street and big banking big shots who now control the Fed. And one of the things that we're going to try to do is to is to make the Fed transparent again and to restore American sovereignty over it and restore some economic order so that we can begin definancializing de the economy and reindustrializing the American landscapes and the American economy and the American middle class. Yeah, there's a lot of history there. Uh, you know, the the what, the reason that that dollar printing works and doesn't or hasn't at least for 50 years caused runaway inflation is that other countries are subsidizing it. So up until the 60s, we maintained um, a trade surplus or balanced trade. We exported as much as we imported or even more. And but eventually, um, starting with this, starting in the 1970s and then accelerating thereafter, we began uh, when, when, you know, the rust belt uh, began to, to take hold, we began to import a lot more than we exported. Now, you can't, how can you do that for years and decades and decades? Only if other countries continue to lend you money, uh, you owe them more and more. And that means essentially that all these extra dollars were used to purchase U.S. Treasury bonds. That's what allows us to continue this um, uh, trade deficit, which goes along with deindustrialization because we're not making the stuff ourselves anymore. And that state of affairs was enforced through uh, U.S. military power and, and diplomacy um, and, and leveraging our uh, post-World War II status that, you know, even to this day, there's still some of it. Like America still has a cachet, even to this day in many places in the world. But the game is kind of running out, you know, and uh, China, the BRICS, uh, uh, India, even many, much of the, the world is no longer willing to subsidize our trade deficit. And so that means we have to reindustrialize. And I think like it, it took a while for us to notice because of this financialization, corporations um, made their money through financial investment instead of through capital investment in real productivity. Uh, and you know, their returns looked good, but actually what was happening is that we were importing economic growth from other countries, especially from China, and that enabled them to uh, catch up to us, uh, first Japan and then, and then China. Uh, but we were on kind of a, uh, we were living on borrowed time uh, because of U.S. dollar hegemony. And I'm, not, I'm not sure. I'm afraid I'm going like, too much into macroeconomic theory and stuff. I uh, hope it's not boring for people. But the upshot of it is that now we have, you know, these tens of trillions of dollars in debt that um, 
didn't have too big an impact as long as interest rates were low. But now that the um, now that that inflation is rising because ultimately because other countries are no longer so willing to finance our trade deficits. That's one reason anyway. Um, the, so we had to raise interest rates or thought we had to raise interest rates. Uh, and, and now enormous, uh, you know, hundreds of billions now are going to pay the interest on the debt. Uh, and, and, you know, this is, and so it's landing on ordinary people as, as an economic despair, you know, that, that, I mean, for every generation, for most of American history, each generation was better off than their parents and they would expect life to be more prosperous, healthier, more advanced, uh, with each passing generation. And no one thinks that anymore. So maybe I'll, uh, Turn it over to Emeril. Do you want to make some comments here? Are you with us? Yeah, I am with us. Um, and you know, for for me, the question um, is always who benefits, because we are still producing enormous innovation and value in this country, and people are still paying their taxes, and all of that money. Uh, that could be invested back into our communities, into our schools, into childcare, into education, into infrastructure, into support for small businesses, revitalizing all the forgotten communities is instead being spent uh, at the behest of corporations and hedge funds that are directing that expenditure and that policy. And it becomes an escalating cycle, you know. I mean, I remember way back being a, a little kid in government, a tiny, brand new, you know, twenty-three-year-old intern, and uh, as part of a kind of introductory process, sitting in on a meeting along the wall and being really confused about why there were military people attending a meeting about U.S. Dom domestic economic health and asking afterwards. And the, uh, the person who I was shadowing said, you know, well, economics is a national security issue, you know, which is makes sense. That's sort of a vague answer, but okay. But then went on to finish by saying, you know, ever since we got rid of the draft in this country, we've relied on an economic draft. And if we don't have enough people who want to take us up on the offer of an economic draft, we're in trouble. And that, to me, was more horrifying than almost anything else I heard the entire time I was in government. The idea that there that there is a willingness to abandon a part of our American public to become grist for the war machine and put them purposefully in an economic situation where the GI Bill is the only path to a college education, to an affordable home, to health care for themselves and their family for the rest of their lives, a subsidized car loan, everything you need as a young person to actually aspire to the American dream anymore. You have to sign up to kill or be killed. And if you make it home, you still don't make it home as the same person you were when you left. But that's the deal. In order to get access to, to the American dream anymore for many people. And the upshot of that is you end up with a military imperialism overseas that escalates the cycle, right? You look at uh, the the hedge fund ownership of defense contractors, and it's absolutely across the board. I mean, BlackRock has I think six or seven billion in Boeing, uh, another five in Northrop, billions in General Dynamics, billions in Raytheon. They go and wage war overseas, increase the cost of living for every person back home, 
by disrupting supply chains, creating energy vacuums overseas so that heating prices get more expensive at home, which is exactly what's happened with the Ukraine war and the, the Nord Stream pipeline. Um, just, you know, boosting gas prices so no one can afford to get to work. And then when they're done bombing the country that we, we whether it's Iraq or Afghanistan, there are reconstruction contracts that those same hedge funds then get paid hundreds of billions of more taxpayer dollars in order to go overseas and and rebuild what they have just destroyed. And all of that is taxpayer money. And as Charles points out, when the, the predictable upshot of that is economic suffering back home, the financial tools that are available uh, you know, to combat the inflation that was sort of the predictable result of government policies are, are rate hikes. And those rate hikes are designed to fix government mistakes by making sure that you get fired from your job or that you don't get the raise that you need for your salary to stay, you know, keep pace with cost of living. And those rate hikes also increase the amount of your taxpayer money that's going just to pay interest rates. Like I did this calculation the other day, just out of curiosity, based on the last interest rate hike. And if you look at individual income tax returns in this country, 56% of them, the money that comes from 56% of individual income tax returns in total goes just to pay our interest rates. I mean, our interest payments now doesn't go to build roads in your community. It doesn't go to service hospitals. It doesn't go to educate your kids or keep you safe in an emergency. It just goes to pay interest on our debt. And that's only going to continue to get worse as those interest rates go up. And so the, getting rid of this corporate capture is is the necessary first step to fix each and every one of those challenges from healthcare to education to infrastructure to childcare. And it, it's one of the reasons that I'm so proud to be working side by side on this campaign because, it, it, you know, trying to, to cut off the, the, the uh, you know, many heads without putting the dagger in the heart is just impossible. And I, it, removing the hedge fund and corporate control is really the only way to make life in America affordable for hardworking people again. So that's what uh, Amarellis Kennedy does. Between feeding her kids, she's uh, calculating the relationship between interest rates and, and the national debt. But well, thank you for that. Only so we can fix it, Bobby. Only so we can fix it. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things that you and I always talk about is that if you're if you come from a poor neighborhood, if you're in the Rust Belt or your Appalachia, or if you live in Watts or Compton or Harlem or Bed Stuy, um, oftentimes the only way out of that kind of dire poverty, you've got a lousy education system that's not going to prepare you for any sort of decent job. And if you you can either turn to drugs or you can find a way out. And for most. American kids, the, the most obvious way out is through military service because you sign up, you go get enlisted, and then all of a sudden you've got a home, you've got a, a shelter, you have food, you have insurance, you have health insurance, you have uh, education, the government pays for all of that. But the demand it makes on, on you is that you go to a foreign country and kill people and risk your life. And then you come back with PTSD and uh, and we don't give the, the Veterans Administration enough resources to treat you. So that's this cycle that, you know, is all part of the war machine. And one of the things that I'm going to do in the White House is to enlarge the Peace Corps, to make it, to give it a domestic program so that people, kids can leave those neighborhoods and they can spend two or three years serving their community and they can get some benefits for that. They can, you know, they can get a, a cheaper housing loan. They can get education. The government will help them with that. 
and they can uh, and get health insurance and all those things that you can only get now from military service. But to actually start rebuilding the middle class from the ground up by through a program that serves communities, that rebuilds American communities, that, you know, builds homes. There's, there's over 300 malls and bankrupt malls in this country that are just sitting there. And, you know, we're going to move into those malls and we're going to teach kids how to build prefab homes and, and teach them how to be electricians and how to be carpenters and how to be roofers and build little homes for people uh, to to rent out you know, these kind of what we call backyard addendum homes that people can rent out to help pay their rents and build larger homes that we can put on all of these plots that have now appeared across America's cities from tax areas and, and uh, Yeah, you're you're yeah, cutting out, Bobby. Centered I, 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 around I, the military. You're just cutting out for a second. Thanks, yeah. everyone. It's. I was going to go to some questions. Let me just add, Stephanie. Let me just add one more th quick thing. Can you hear um, me? Okay. Yeah, Stephanie. Can I add, just add one more quick thing here to the, uh, to the domestic peace corps? You know, Bobby mentioned. Um, I was going to go to Johnny for our first question, Johnny. Hey, thanks. Stephanie, I don't think you can hear Charles. Charles. 